I can, before you start, you might tell all those people there are plenty of seats. Here. <laughs> I think they're trying to stay in the back on purpose. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are seats. Come on up uh, and grab one. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, good to see you all. Uh, and I have to echo uh, Terry's comments. I actually do believe I love this museum more than the one in D.C. Uh, this one is much more intimate. Uh, the one in DC is super overwhelming. Uh, so everyone who's been involved in this, it is a gem. Uh, keep it just the way it is. Um, my name is Kenneth Campbell. Uh, as you read from my bio, probably I'm the executive director of IDEA Public Schools, uh, Southern Louisiana. Uh, and IDEA is an education management organization that has achieved tremendous success in Texas and had been asked for years to expand <coughs> outside of the borders of Texas and do work in other places and had always declined. Uh, ultimately, they decided that the first work that they would do would be in Louisiana. And there were a couple of important statistics, I think, that had a lot to do with that. While we are last on most measures of educational progress and, and welfare uh, in Louisiana, there are a couple of stats where we are first. And the most important one is in terms of incarceration. Uh, Louisiana is the incarceration capital of the world. Uh, one in 86 uh, adults uh, in Louisiana is in the prison system in some way, shape, or form or another. Uh, that is five times the rate of Iran. It is 13 times the rate of China. Uh, our largest prison, Angola, is, uh, has 5,300 prisoners. It's the largest in the U.S. 75% uh, of those prisoners are black. 75% uh, of the prisoners are serving life sentences. And over 90% are expected to die while they're in prison. So while many of our stats are incredibly low, that's the worst place to be number one. Uh, and so when we had conversations with IDEA and I helped to bring them there, uh, I was very happy to get an opportunity to lead that effort. And so when we have conversations about the importance of education, when we have conversations about equity, uh, Louisiana is always at the forefront of my mind. So I'm very pleased to be able to moderate this uh, discussion today. Um, so I think we find ourselves in a very interesting place in America. Um, questions and debates about race, about class, about equity, uh, about social justice are at the forefront. And it seems, if you look at any of our political discourse, that we are just about tearing ourselves apart at the seams. When we have those sorts of, when we have that sort of situation, it is my view that the one place, the place where we have to try to make change real and lasting is in education. Education should be the place, and our schools should be the place where right now our kids are learning to disagree without being disagreeable. Where they should learn to respect and, and listen to other people's points of views, even if they don't agree with them. And at some point, you can have the permission to change your mind to understand that difference is not something that should always be feared, and to understand that working together, we could expand this pie in a way and not you know, believe that just what we have has to be taken by whoever can get it first. Uh, and we're missing some of those things. And so all these questions right now are at the forefront. So I think this is very timely. And so we're going to be digging into some delicate questions about race and equity uh, in our efforts to really have a discussion that will increase knowledge and understanding. And uh, I think the Philanthropy Roundtable and, and the people who are helping to fund education are the right people to be having a lot of these conversations. So you know, we're going to try to guide us through this by going back to the past a little bit you know, coming forward to the future and figuring out, you know, hopefully where we go from here. And I got three great people to help do that. So uh, I'm very encouraged. And I know you guys have seen their bios, so I'm not a big reader or bio guy. Uh, so I'll be able to tell you a little bit something about them that you may not know. Uh, and I'll start down here with my friend, uh, Virginia Walden Ford, who I've known for many, many years. Um, and the, the thing that really, really just amazed me was when I got an opportunity to meet her twin sister, Harrietta. <laughs> if you did not know, she has a twin sister. And she is just as brilliant and beautiful as Jenny, a lady of distinction. And when you see them together, the dynamic is truly interesting. So <laughs> she, is a um, she is also uh, the subject of a forthcoming movie at one of these days called Miss Virginia. Uh, so let's be on the lookout for that. I think it'll be exciting. Virginia Walden Ford.
Uh, you all know um, Mr. Pitt Hyde, you know, obviously, because he's from Memphis, and you probably know more about him than I do. But I feel like we're very fortunate to get him here for this session, because he and his wife just came back from the Seychelles, where they were fishing. And he had days where he was catching as many as 20 bonefish. Now, anybody who fishes know that 20 fish in a year is a good year. <laughs> so if he's catching 20 a day, I'm really glad that he decided to get on the plane and come back and join us I in know, this discussion. Right. Mr. Pitt Hyde. And Ms. Cheryl Brown Henderson obviously is a name uh, that carries a lot of weight. Uh, but what she would tell you is her most important things right now are family. Uh, she has three-year-old grandkids, a boy and a girl, uh, that she's very passionate about. And she discovered a new cousin who is actually here on the agenda for this session. Uh, Miss Leslie uh, Brown. Brown, who is back there in the back, yeah. uh, <laughs> works, works for the Memphis Education Foundation. Fund. Fund. The Memphis Education Fund. And Cheryl was surprised to get an email you know, one day they said, hey, we're both on this panel and we're going to be in Memphis at the same time. Isn't that cool? It is. Very cool. <laughs> Cheryl Brown Henderson. Yep. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to go back to the past a little bit. We're going to uh, explore uh, some of the experiences that these folks have had, uh, and then we're going to begin to move the conversation forward uh, to the future. And, and I think I want to start uh, with you, Cheryl. Obviously, I mean, um, your father, Dr. Oliver Brown, the lead plaintiff in Brown versus the Board of Education. What can you tell us about that story? You know, what are the remembrances that you have uh, from this time? Well, first of all, you know, I'm so, I'm so pleased you acknowledge my new cousin. You know, <laughs> it's amazing that you have their relatives out there that you yeah. don't know. But she took the initiative, and seeing that we're both on the program, I mean, how for fortuitous is that and amazing. Uh, my father, Oliver Brown, for whom Brown versus the Board of Education is named, uh, the legal citation is Oliver L. Brown et al. versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas et al. I really despise E-T-A-L. <laughs> and any time I'm in a room of attorneys, I tell them how deplorable, you know, those four little letters are because they bury people and they obscure people. And in the case of Brown v. Board, they buried hundreds of people, many people who sacrificed mightily to be part of the Supreme Court decision and to make this change for our country. My dad was a minister, and so I'm very fond of full rooms. Thank you. <laughs> but he, uh, I say that because one of the things growing up we learned is that Church for African Americans was our, our social service agency. It was our safety net. It was our town hall. It was our spiritual uplift. And so growing up as the child of a pastor, I always felt that sense of belonging that so many people struggle for. Uh, Brown v. Board, I think of in terms of myths, challenges, and unanticipated consequences. And the myth of Brown is many people think, and pardon me for borrowing, they believe Brown v. Board was a wrinkle in time, when in fact it was more than a century in the making. And so my father's advocacy as a parent was part of that historic continuum that began in the mid 1800s and then continued on to into the 19th or to the 20th century. Kansas, uh, where my dad came of age, is unique in that it was a hotbed of uh, school dissent cases. Many people don't know that. So his involvement of Brown v. Board and the path to that decision, you know, came, it's something that was easily understood. Now, Kansas began litigating these cases, school to say cases, in the late 1800s and continued on to into uh, the mid to late uh, 1900s. So Brown v. Board in 50 to 54 was the 12th case in the state of Kansas. So this was not something that we were uh, afraid of, nothing that was foreign to us. The paradigm shift, though, for the African American parents in Kansas who were advocating through the courts. The shift was the NAACP. Prior to that, the cases were litigated by the parents and their private attorneys. The NAACP in Topeka was founded in 1913, and the first president was a white U.S. Senator, Arthur Capper, when the NAACP used to be a very diverse organization. Now, my father came of age, you know, watching these cases, watching the activism of the NAACP. There were three cases in the city of Topeka before Brown v. Board. 
two elementary cases and one junior high case. The junior high case was successful because junior high schools were not supposed to be segregated in Kansas, only elementary schools. So he's watching this, you know, he's, he's coming into his own. He had been mentored by an African-American entrepreneur who was a mortician and owned a funeral home, Newt Bowser. So that instilled in my dad a sense of civic responsibility. And he began looking for ways, you know, because African-American men during that period were living in the margins, if you will, really not on anybody's radar. So they were always looking for, for ways. He tried boxing, and we joke about that one. <laughs> and then he uh, drove a coal truck, and then he decided to pursue theology. And we think after he was knocked out in the Golden Gloves for the first time, he was called into the ministry. <laughs> but nonetheless, this was the path he took on the way to becoming Brown v. Board of Education. So in the summer of 1950, when the NAACP was organizing this case, it was an organizational movement, again, that people believing it just sprung up out of nowhere. It's so, so wrong. Um, so when people were being recruited to be plaintiffs in Brown v. Board, uh, the internet will tell you all sorts of things about dad's involvement that are just not true. It was not his idea. He's not the sole plaintiff. He never met Thurgood Marshall. He didn't serve in World War II. There's so many things out there that people just fill in the blanks. So anyway, when he was asked to be part of Brown v. Board by a childhood friend who was an attorney for the NAACP, he didn't say yes right away. He thought about it for a while. You know, in part because by the time they came to our home, there were 10 people that had already signed on, or nine, and they were all women. He was concerned about the activism of the dads, and mom was expecting me, and, and so didn't get out much then anyway. <laughs> so after much talking and thinking and, and convincing on the part of my mother, he said yes to the NAACP, and in the fall of 1950, joined um, by then 12 other parents who were plaintiffs on behalf of their children for this case. So Brown v. Board was something um, you know, outside of the family structure. The NAACP was thinking and strategizing and planning and trying to, to, to chart a path to make this happen. At the same time in Delaware and South Carolina and Virginia and Washington, D.C., the same thing was going on, unbeknownst to us in Kansas, until the case was appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. So in the fall of 1950, the NAACP directed these parents to take their child or children and a witness attempt to enroll in the nearest white school. Now, another myth. African Americans in our community were not concerning themselves about the white segregated schools. Our four African American segregated schools were stellar. They were all beautiful brick buildings with fireplaces in the kindergarten rooms. They were all built by the same guy that built the white school. So we weren't talking about facilities. The African American children rode buses to school. So we weren't concerned about having transportation. The African American teachers held more advanced degrees than their white counterparts because there was no outlet for that master's or post-master's work except the classroom. So it was a quality education. We weren't concerned about the quality. So Kansas provided the Supreme Court the best test of segregation per se and whether or not it was constitutional to segregate on the basis of race. So what we do at the Brown Foundation every day is develop curriculum and try to educate and train teachers and put out resources and um, you know, research the fact that these days, as amazing as our African American educators were, war is the problem word. <laughs> because there are fewer and fewer African American educators in the classroom, so we're looking to try to help somehow create that new pool of people. So figuring out some way to make the tenants of Brown and my father's legacy, we all leave a legacy by the way, you know, relevant for today, has been um, our life's work, yeah. if you will. But myths, challenges, and unanticipated consequences. And we'll talk about <coughs> the challenges and the unanticipated consequences <laughs> Absolutely. later. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now, Jenny, you grew up in desegregated Arkansas. You attended Little Rock Central High School a right. decade after uh, the Little Rock Nine. Yep. Talk to us about, you know, kind of what this case ultimately meant for you and your schooling. Well, you know, for us, we it, 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 just what Cheryl said, our schools were great, our teachers were from the community, our, you know, our parents were mostly satisfied with what was going on. Um, it, we were fine. So when we were told in the 60s that we were going to attend Central, I think most of us were 
<laughs> I want to go to Horace Mann, which was a black high school in Little Rock, and follow my siblings. And uh, but what we learned later was that because the federal government had sent in uh, federal troops to escort the Little Rock Nine to class. Uh, amidst the horrible crowds and horrible conditions, they really had said to Arkansas, you need to continue the desegregation process. We sent in federal troops, sending those little African-American kids to that school. So they handpicked about 130 of us to go to Central. And um, we talked about this before as we were discussing what we would talk about here. It was horrible. I hated that school. I did not want to go there. I cried every day till school started, and I begged my family not to send me there. And my dad said, you have a responsibility to go there. You have younger siblings. You need to go and take advantage of everything the school has to offer to you. That's one of my younger siblings over there, and uh, Doris. And, um, and I remember sitting there in front of the school, incidentally, where he was dropping me off, thinking, okay, I can do this. I took that very, very seriously. So I went into Central, and I became just transformed by the library. I had never seen a library with so many books in a school. And then I was I went to the gym. And it was as big as my junior high school. And uh, I mean, this, this was an amazing building. Central still is an amazing building. And for a moment, I got what my father was saying. You know, go there, get everything you can. And, uh, and it, but it was tough. I mean, we were called names. We were picked on. We met at the edge of the school every day to walk home together so kids wouldn't beat us up. Uh, we, we, I, there was a little a girl in my hallway, and she and I would get to the lockers together, and she called me the N-word every day for three years. But if we fought back, we got expelled. White kids got suspended for two weeks or two days or whatever. They put us out. So we learned how to not fight back and just take it. And I think it built my strength. It built my backbone, strengthened my backbone to do the kind of work I've done in the future, or I did in the future, or the kind of person I became, because we had to be tough. But when I got ready to go to college, I was really glad that I could put on my application to college that I attended Little Rock Central High School because it did create a discussion, you know, and people wanted to know what it was like. And, um, and, and you know, I got a chance to articulate how I felt about going to school, but it, it, it was not easy for any of us. My class, former class, I mean, my, my classmates and I, we talk about, we're getting ready to celebrate 50 years. And, um, <laughs> and so we were having meetings, and we've been meeting with our white classmates as well. Now, when we were Central, we had no relationship with those kids. Most of their parents had told them to stay away from us. So we didn't have those kind of friendships. Those friendships were developed later on in the, after we got grown, when we realized it was stupid not to talk to people that went to some school. <laughs> and uh, so we've been planning our fifth reunion for next year. And one of the things that has really been a part of the conversation is why weren't we friends? And what did we learn from those experiences? It's been an, a really interesting opportunity to discuss what happened to us at school and how so many of us academically, I think we were strengthened and, and we, we, we obtained a lot of different kind of things. Emotionally, I think it took away the fun of high school. Mm -hmm. You know, if when I think back about it and, and I talk to <coughs> my uh, classmates about this, I don't have any real happy memories. I remember I went there with a purpose because my dad said, this one over here and my younger sister needed me to be strong and I believed him. But it wasn't happy memories. We had two separate proms. You know, teachers didn't talk to us in class. You could raise your hand till it was falling off and people wouldn't call <laughs> on you. So it was, it was an interesting experience. And I want to speak about my dad. So I'm in the 10th grade. 
and I don't like the school at all. And my dad, in the midst of my 10th grade year, gets appointed the first black assistant superintendent of the Little Rock School District. I just couldn't understand how he'd do that to me. You know, I was having enough trouble, you know. So all of a sudden, daddy's all over the news, and my sister, there's five of us, five girls, we're all over the news, and they're, they're calling us the little foul girls, and, and, um, and, but then it struck me I could really use this to my advantage. <laughs> and uh, all those teachers that were being mean to me, I say, my father is a sister superintendent. <laughs> Until I got in trouble for saying that. And my dad said, never, ever do that again. So uh, it, it was an interesting experience, but it did prepare me for the world. Yeah. And I think the most important thing that any of us learn as we're growing from K to 12 is the, getting enough to prepare us for whatever the future will bring. And I cannot even tell you how much my experiences, not only at Central, but in segregated schools, um, just really helped mold the person that I became, that, that, or that I am today. And so it, it was an interesting experience. Yeah, it was a good excellent. One. Well, I want to stay in the 60s. Mr. Hyatt? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's stay in the 60s. I don't have any stories to <laughs> But you have some good stories, right? So, you know, 1968, uh, take us back to the period uh, before Dr. King died, uh, or right after he died, and, you know, kind of what was your role, and, and kind of what was, how did you engage with the community in that just very tough, raw, emotional time? Ironically, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a family business, Malone and Hyde, which was wholesale and retail food. And so, you know, I was always involved in the business from a time as a little kid. And it turned out to be fortuitous because, you know, like three years after I got out of college, my father became ill and I had to take over the business at 26 years old. And that happened to be 68. Wow. You know, so I had, you know, and of course, I was, you know, it was sort of like the ultimate baptism by fire. <laughs> At that age, when everybody's reporting to you, is like 50 or so, you know, years old. So that was a challenge. And then, of course, the tragedy of King's assassination occurred. And <clears throat> Memphis, up to that point, was the largest city in the state and fastest growing. And I mean, it just devastated our economy because even though you know James Earl Ray was tracking King around the country he obviously assassinated him here and the the city took the hit for all of that and um, and so that was a challenge and then the interesting thing was is after that you know uh, the practice in town among the African-American leadership was Anytime they had an issue, they'd go and pick at their nearest supermarket. Well, at the time, we had a 70% share in the Memphis market, so they always picked it at <laughs> one of our stores. <laughs> and they always insisted on <clears throat> meeting with the, the president, you know. And so it, it, it turned into a very interesting experience because, I mean, I met everybody under the sun from the most radical to the most moderate but the interesting thing about it is I got to know all these people and I'll never forget uh, a person that had a profound impact on me and who became a lifelong friend was Maxine Smith and so she, she was leading this group and they insisted on meeting with me well I all I had heard about Maxine was what was in the local paper and they painted her as some bomb thrower, you know, <laughs> radical. So, uh, so with some fear and trepidation, you know, I agreed to this meeting. And to my amazement, she walks through the door and here's this charming lady who's just as reasonable as can be. And so we sat down in five minutes, we worked out the few issues we had. And of course, from that day forward, we became close friends and worked together on all the challenges that were going on in the city at the time, which were numerous with all the transitions that were happening. Uh, and of course, she was such a classic person and 
and her husband Vasco and we became great friends and we just worked and of course she was early on uh, a member of the board of this of uh, the Civil Rights Museum which I got involved with right when it was in the planning stages yeah, yeah. so uh, that was very fortuitous and likewise I, you know I got to be very close with Ben Hooks who five years yeah. after this place opened he moved back to Memphis having okay. retired from running the NAACP yeah. and so he became the chairman here and that's when we really started making some real progress yeah. and of course he and Francis such wonderful people. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Well, you know, since you talked about the museum and this, we're in this wonderful place, I'm sure that, you know, everybody just got together and sang Kumbaya and created uh, this. <laughs> no, that's not. <laughs> yeah, I, hardly, hardly. <laughs> well, so, you know, it was uh, the museum, of course, I mean, the, the Lorraine Motel. Uh, and of course, it was uh, at the time. It was the only. It was where all the civil rights people and all the music musicians and everybody else that came stayed because it was the one place where they could stay because it had black ownership, yeah. and uh, so it was the place everybody uh, uh, came to. Well, after that tragedy, you know, it fell. You know, it it, it, it ultimately closed, and it stood here empty for 25 years. And um, finally, uh, uh, three you know um, local African American uh, leaders got involved in the thing, and they got the state to put up half the money, and they got the county and the city to put up half, <coughs> and then they got me involved, and and we put up the first private money into this, and later started raising money to support it so a nonprofit foundation could yeah. run it. But our objective, and of course the objective of all of us, was that we wanted to take this tragic site and turn it into something positive that recognized the heroes and heroines of the civil rights movement and take this tragic site and turn it into something positive for Memphis and for the country. And you know, I think uh, over time we were we were able to accomplish that. But of course, in the early days, I never forget. You know, I'd go to I'd go to these board meetings, and we would we wouldn't even get through the reading of the minutes. <laughs> it was not. It was because it, it, ironically, it was mainly the black leadership that were fighting with each other about who was in charge and who was doing this and who was doing that. And of course, here I'm. You know, I'm sort of. You know, I'm this uh, wealthy white guy sitting there, you know, and what, what the heck are you doing there? And so the whole time I was saying, I knew the, the long-term importance of this yeah. as a healing force yeah. in our community. And so I'd sit there and I'd say, all right, Lord, I'm, and this is my ultimate redemption. I know this is the right thing to do, and I'm going to hang in here, and somehow we're going to work all this out. And of course, for the first five years, it was very turbulent. But once Ben Hooks, you know, was involved, of course, Maxine was too. They were, you know, such rational yeah. people, and they just, you know. So then, you know, we really started getting our act together and moving forward. And the other thing we did, you know, we chronicled the history, and we wanted to recognize the, the champions of uh, individual rights and freedom. <laughs> both domestically around the world and that's when we started the Freedom Awards yeah. which um, you know we, we were so fortunate because we had every you know people such as Nelson Mandela the Dalai Lama we've had all kind of I mean the lead, you know leading people in the country but past presidents Jimmy yeah. Carter and and um, uh, so it's just been and of course having the privilege of meeting all those people yeah. over time <laughs> and I think that the thing it also did having you know we have our annual banquet where we recognize them and we also have a daytime program where we bring in all the school kids mm -hmm. and of course one of our real roles here is today you know the majority of the kids weren't even born right. in 68 mm -hmm. so to educate them on the history and that really you know what it was like back then 
you know, because a lot of them, you know, they, they, they get involved in the news and they say, oh, nothing's changed. Well, of course, Ben Hooks <laughs> used to always take great pleasure and say, listen, son, let me tell you, it, a lot has changed. Now, you, we got a, you still got a long way to go, but a lot has changed. But it, it, it really has been, uh, really brought our community together and it served a real special purpose. And of course, today the museum is so well received. I mean, we have, you know, 300,000 visitors a year and it's, it's growing every year. So it's, it, and it's, most of that traffic is out of, out of the area. So we have, you know, and we see our role as a national uh, player. I mean, we have our very historic site, tragic site, but one of which we want to say, you know, you 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 can kill the you, the dreamer, but the dream goes on, you know. And so, and I think I think we, we've uh, made great progress on that, and we continue to work at it every day. And of course, Terry is doing an outstanding job leading the institution. We're very fortunate to have her here with us. Yeah, outstanding. Thank you. Very cool. Let's shift to today. Uh, how, you know, when we think about this conversation about opportunity and equity and, and choice, right, how do we develop an agenda that allows, you know, our parents to be able to choose, no matter where they come from, no matter what they look like, the best possible school for them? Well, in our case, you know, I was, I was living in Washington, D.C. I'm in Arkansas now, but I lived in D.C. for a number of years. And about 20 years ago, almost, I guess, one of my children, my own children, was having difficulties in school and needed a different kind of environment. And, of course, I was a young mother raising kids in D.C., and I couldn't afford to send them anywhere but the neighborhood school, which was really troubled and really challenging. And I came upon... Um, some legislators that said something to me that I thought would be perfect for the children in D.C. and that was we want to provide a scholarship program for low-income kids to attend schools in D.C. Um, and uh, and it just it, I thought oh my this is perfect for me this would be perfect. And then I realized not only would it be perfect for me, but it would be perfect for my neighbors. So my input, my step into trying to figure out what to do with children that were in, I think at the time, this was in the late 90s, 46% um, of DC kids were not finishing, were dropping out of school, dropout rate was high. Uh, it was the fourth worst school district in the nation. And I'm, this is the district, this is the seat of government. How can we not educate our children? So my step in was to fight for the, the district's children through um, advocating for a, a scholarship program for uh, African, well, for low-income kids in D.C., which in, ended up having about 95% African-American children and 5% um, of <laughs> Hispanic mostly, but some Asian kids. Catherine back there was our ally with Speaker Boehner and our champions, and 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 we believed, and I still believe this very strongly, that pro by providing this kind of opportunity for low-income kids, you know, it gives parents something to to. Um, hold on to, to educate the children. I remember a legislator, who I won't name, who represents D.C., told me. <laughs> <laughs> we know that, who that is. Yeah, that, that there will be a time, Virginia, when these things will be okay. Just tell the parents to wait. You know, tell the parents, it's coming, we're working on it. And I remember telling her, and I, I read somebody else says this, so we, a whole bunch of us have said this, how long do our families have to wait? You know, I, I mean, these kids will graduate from high school and we'll still be waiting. And so at that time I felt, all right, you know, we're gonna make sure that we move this along. So we actually organized thousands of low-income parents in D.C. to advocate on behalf of their children. That was my, you know, strongest input into this. I, I, I yeah. also support charter schools, 
52% of Washington, D.C. kids attend charter schools. There are 99 campuses yeah. in D.C., many of whom we directed parents to go to through an organization that I ran called D.C. Parents for School yeah. Choice. So at the time, we believed in, um, I'm, a, I'm a proud and firm voucher proponent. I believe in vouchers. I believe every parent ought to have a financial opportunity to send their children wherever they choose and have the resources to do so. Yeah. I also believe in traditional public schools that are of quality. Yeah. I believe in homeschool. I, I'm just a all, all, all of it. over the place. Mm -hmm. over yeah. but, but the bottom line is I believe the parents have to have an opportunity. I have three kids of my own. Each one of them learn differently. Each one of them. I picked, I spent hours trying to find schools that worked for each of those kids. And as a result, I have three amazing adults. Yeah. You know, because that's what parents want to do. And um, now my kids never benefited from the voucher program in D.C. because it took 10 years. To get it done. And yeah. by the time we we were able to get it passed. My kids were grown and married, and uh, <laughs> and a couple had kids. Yeah. But uh, uh, so, but it's about fighting to make sure the parents have those tools. They also told us at the beginning of the fight that low-income parents in Washington D.C. would not uh, advocate for their children. They didn't care, mm -hmm. and we proved them very wrong. Every parent cares about what happens. I can right. go to. Ohio or, or Idaho or North Dakota, South Dakota, close my mind, close my eyes and I hear the same thing from every parent that I heard from African American parents in Washington DC who said, I want to fight for my kids. Yeah. I want to make sure that my children, and I'm bringing this up, oh Terry left, but I'm a parent activist. I'm a parent first and a whatever second. <laughs> but my sole reason for getting involved with fighting for opportunities for children was because of my own kids. Yeah. And I remember telling parents, when the fight gets hard, and Catherine, it got hard, right? Keep a picture of your child. This was before cell yeah. phones, so we couldn't turn on the cell yes. phone. Yes, you a picture. <laughs> so they had to have paper pictures. So <laughs> put a picture of your child in your pocket. And every time an opponent cusses you out, Every time a member of Congress tells you you're brainwashed, every single time a reporter comes up and calls your name or, or anybody, take that picture out and it reminds yourself who you're fighting to fight for. Yeah. You know, in 20 years, I went through hundreds of pictures of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I was really happy about cell phones because yeah. I could sure. just turn it on. <laughs> Smartphones, yes. I guess, because I could just turn it on and pull Get up the a picture. picture of the kid. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, so that that yeah. where I, we are today. Yeah. Um, I'm still fighting. Yeah. You know, so I, I will I have continue sure. to fight. Sure, why is this still a debate? I, yeah, the thing that, that I guess two things. I, I used to be a teacher back in the day. I taught for four years, 72 to 76, and I taught at Monroe, which was the school that had been segregated that my mom and sisters had attended, and then their kids, and then I taught there. And when I taught there, it was still 95% African American. The teaching is hard work. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, it, it pains me when people suggest, because it's children at the heart of it, that it, it's simple. It's, it's something any simpleton can get. It is not. You know, I would dare anybody that makes that statement to go into a classroom and teach. You know, not just keep the kids interested, engaged, disciplined, all of that, dealing with the parents and the bureaucracies of public schools. It is hard work. The thing, though, that bothers me about the current discussion, we act like it's new. We use the newness to scare people. We've always had educational options of alternative schools, of parochial schools, of home schools, of church support, you know, all of that has been with us. And I think that if you, if you try to make it new and scary, you know, then you can get this big political battle going on about you're siphoning off this from public schools if you do this. And if you do this, then you're, you're taking the, you know, the cream of the crop to make sure you succeed. If you do this, but who is losing? 
while the adults are having these foolhardy discussions. Our children, you know, we really can't afford to keep losing generations of children. So when Virginia talks about advocating, absolutely we all care about our kids. I mean, my husband and I were always at parent-teacher conferences, and when he couldn't go, I would go alone to make sure they understood that this young man had somebody you know, in his home who was not only concerned about how he behaved, but I was concerned about how educators interacted with him. My, my one story is an, an art teacher. My son was, you know, art was his minor in college, but he got a D in art. So I go to school to see what's up with this D in art. And I find that it was fourth hour, which is right after lunch. So what I discovered was the, the teacher, an older white woman, my son was about, well, he's 6'5 now, he's probably about 6'3 then in high school. So he was in the back of the classroom. She didn't like him because he represented what she saw in popular culture in the media. And so he knew this. So they had this little dance going on. So he would be late every day because she didn't care anyway. He's in the back of the room where he shouldn't have been. So I go and I find all this out by asking questions. So then I pulled out my calendar and I said, okay, this is what I need y'all to do. I said, you, Mrs. XYZ, whatever her name was at the time, I need you to be a teacher. I need you to be the adult in this relationship. And if I need to, I'll come every day at fourth hour to make sure the two of you work this out to my satisfaction. <laughs> then I looked at him and I said, you have a responsibility, Chris, as my son, you know, to make sure you're not only representing this family, but doing what you know to be right. Back to her. I want him in the front of the classroom, you know? <laughs> so I wrote down time fourth hour started, put it on my day planner, and I promised them if they didn't get it worked out, I'd be the new student in the classroom. <laughs> so after a week or so, I started getting little notes from her. Oh, your son's art will be hanging in the bank this weekend <laughs> where we've got student exhibits going on. They got it together because somebody, somebody called both of them on it. You know, our children are not angels. So we have to make sure we're make, that they understand what we expect of them. At the same time, educators understand what we expect of them. Yeah. You know, people are abdicating their responsibility wholesale. There is no reason why children in traditional public schools, charter schools, parochial schools, wherever, are not learning to the max. No reason. We know how to educate kids. We know it takes small class sizes. We know it takes remediation when necessary. We know it takes assistance in classrooms because sometimes they're overcrowded. We, we know the answer, but it's like she said, the legislator that would tell her to wait, that's politics. It had nothing to do with the children who were going to lose out. You know, so it's too much self-service yeah. and not enough public service yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this room and people have their fingers on the pulse of philanthrop philanthropic giving, you know, I applaud you. Because while we're tinkering over here, you know, with, with politics, you know, somebody needs to be writing the checks yeah. and supporting the educational initiatives to make certain these things can happen, make certain the Virginians of the world have the support they need, and the Cheryls of the world can go to school with that day planner. Yeah. You know, we need to make sure, but it, it's, it's just um, nonsensical, I'll yeah. put it that way, yeah. to suggest we don't know. We know, and the achievement gap is something people love tossing out. When I was teaching, it used to be sensitivity training. And then it became students at risk. Then it became diversity initiatives. Then it became, you know, all these little buzzwords and phrases to keep schools, to keep parents, low-income parents and children hamstrung, you know, while we don't do our jobs as educators and as community members to make sure they're educated. So, you know, you know I, don't, I don't buy it that, that the kids are, are, are the problem. We are the problem in that we don't support them and their educators and their parents when they're in circumstances where they don't have adequate employment or housing or health care and our nutritional food. All of those things are part of the equation and it is intentional. So one of the things I always say in my lectures on college campuses is before you start saying to me as a person of color that you're just a bit too sensitive when people bring up these issues other than saying talk to the hand. What I tell them is let's go back a little bit. 
Let's start with the U.S. Constitution. Let's look at, at Dred Scott. Let's look at Plessy v. Ferguson. Let's look at all the opportunities this country had to stop the division. It was intentional that there would be second class citizens to do the bidding of the majority that wanted to keep their, their power in privilege. People are scared to death about the coming demographics. And you only need to fear because you're making sure the coming demographics are, are being marginalized, uninformed, without education, without hope, without, yeah, that should scare you to death. Yeah. So until we start educating, employing, housing, and giving nutritional food, respecting, yeah. then there's gonna be a lot to fear. Yeah. But that, I'm off yeah, my soapbox. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. We like the soapbox. The soapbox is cool. <laughs> so, so, Mr. Hyatt, when you think about this uh, from a, a perspective of a community leader, uh, a person who clearly cares for kids and who um, has helped to fund, um, I think, just a lot of the initiatives around education, you and people around this room, how are, these, how are the conversations about equity? Right, impacting how you think about giving and, and how you think about you know the conversation that you have with city leaders about where we need to go in order to achieve the outcomes that kids really need. It's it's so critically important. Um, you know, I first you know became real concerned about the subject. You know, I was I told you the circumstance. I took over at a young age, and I you know the thing that kept disturbing me is people, you know, you would go to fill a job and people would come in and interview for the job and here they were high school graduates and yeah. couldn't fill out the job yeah. application, yeah. you know? And so you start, you know, you start looking into it and of course the state at the time, and it was typical of most states, yeah. I mean Tennessee was no different anywhere else, they said that 86% of the kids were proficient in English and math. And yet, when the NAEP <laughs> scores would come out, it yeah. was twenty-two percent. Yeah. You know, and so here are these these low-income kids have, were being assigned to their neighborhood school that had been failing for thirty and forty years. Yeah. I mean, it's criminal. It's like being assigned to the reservation. Or yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so the first thing, you know, uh, obviously. We, you know, we tried to work with the system, but the system was all about jobs. It wasn't about kids. And of course, the teachers' union and the bureaucracy and the elected school board, you know, they had 25 excuses for everything. Yeah. And um, so, you know, we the first thing, you know, looking around the country and seeing that charter schools were just getting going and that. The great value we saw in charter schools was an example to demonstrate that all this garbage that people have been saying about, well, you can't expect us yes. to teach these poor kids because they, they're this, they're that, and all that. Well, you know, in the right environment with a good principal and good teachers, heck yeah you can. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you can take a kid from a poor background that was doomed to failure to become a ward of the state in one form or another, either in jail or on welfare or something horrible, and all of a sudden you could change their life trajectory. Mm -hmm. That is no more noble mission than that. Now the thing that we found out very quickly is that you know, the money is the small end of the stick. When you're trying to change public policy, mm -hmm. it's a sweat equity, because you've got to get to know every politician, you got to know every bureaucrat, and you got to take a very long view, because man, you're you're dealing with <laughs> entrenched interests mm -hmm. that have spent their whole life trying to absurd. maintain the status quo, mm -hmm. just like what you guys are talking yeah. about. And so, I mean, it took me walking the halls of the legislature five years yeah. to finally get the charter law passed. Mm -hmm. And and you know, and I know we'll forget after we got it passed, the, one of the union leaders said, 
well, you know, we can't we can't have this thing. If, if it works, it might spread. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the whole point. <laughs> so, it, it, and of course, the thing that was always so ironic to me is the teachers' union. I mean, Memphis was typical of all urban yeah. cities. I mean, you know, that's the problem. It's such a monolith, yeah. and you got the same entrenched interests, and they are professionals at fighting change. Oh, yeah. You know. And so it, it, it's just, you gotta take a long view, you gotta chip away at it. When we realized we couldn't move the mountain from the top, we first started with charters, and then we got new leaders for new schools mm -hmm. in here, Teach for America, new teacher project. In other words, it was okay, we can't move the mountain from the top, let's start getting best in class kind of programs in here. And, and counting on the cream rising, yeah. which over time is what happened. Yeah. You know, like today, you know, just about all of our people in the reform movement, not just in Memphis, but the whole country, at one point would teach for America. Cause yeah. The beauty of them is they figured out a way to get the best and the brightest yeah. involved in education. Yeah. And so, the, it, you know, it was just, it was a building block. Yeah. But it took us 25 years, and then, you know, it's really in the last 10, that we made the dramatic process, uh, uh, jump because we finally were able to change the rules of the game. Yeah. Where you could hold people accountable for student outcomes, yeah. and results, you could pay for performance, mm -hmm. you could do all the things that were totally prohibited yeah. before. But boy, it was a long, hard slog. <laughs> but nothing is, nothing is more rewarding or more important. I, you know, I truly believe that a liberal democracy cannot prevail in the law pool if you've got a 25, 30 percent right. permanent underclass. That's right. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, Absolutely. if we don't break out of this education monopoly stuff yes. and give more trouble. choices to parents and quality choices, yeah. Yeah. you know that. You know, I mean, you know, as y'all have experienced, mm -hmm. we experienced. It's just such an important thing to do, and, and it's hard, and it never ends. The struggle never ends. There's always something new popping up. And, uh, but there's nothing more important. I think it is the most fundamental civil right yeah. today to give kids a quality education, because mm -hmm. the only opportunity a poor kid has to escape his circumstance is through education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they get a quality education, they are on a totally different path. And, and, and right. if the neighborhood schools are not doing it, then we have to give parents the tools to utilize other options. And those, those options have not been yeah. available for the most part in the inner city. Yeah. Parents in inner cities and urban school districts believe they have to go to whatever the school is they're assigned to. People of, of means have always had choice. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Always. You can move mm -hmm. to a neighborhood, mm -hmm. yep. you could send your child to a private school, you can homeschool, you can do whatever you want if you have means. The only people who have not had those means are poor people. Yeah. That's who I'm talking about advocating yeah. for. Getting out there and making sure when the DC scholarship program passed as a part of a larger piece of legislation. We went out, we set up a, a session where parents could come in and sign their children up for the program, and nobody showed up. And, and so they called and said, what's going on, Jenny? You said that everybody wants this. And I said, the, the teachers' unions, the opposition has been out, and I heard this directly from the parents, telling parents not to sign up for this program that it would not benefit their, their children, kids, yeah. it was wrong, blah, 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 blah. So we went into the communities. We went into their, their neighborhoods. We went into community centers, went to Boys and Girls Club, and by the end of that period, thousands yeah. were signed, had yeah, signed clearly, up. I believe needed. we had 3,000 on the waiting list the first year. Yeah. So you have to look at my parents were teachers, my sisters all taught, but the fact of the matter is, it ain't getting into the African American yeah. community. Parents in the African American community need activists. Yeah. They need advocates. Yeah. They need millions, thousands of people that are willing 
to put their own reputations on the line. You think I didn't get death threats? <laughs> yeah, because people didn't want to hear what I had to say. Yeah. And then they didn't want to hear what 3,000 parents had to say. They didn't want to hear what 5,000 in Cleveland had to say. They didn't want to hear what yeah. all of these programs that have been creating these environments where parents are getting what they need to give their children an education. I am, I know some faces in this audience, I know you funded a bunch of those programs. And, and we were appreciative, but more than anything, the parents yeah. care. I keep in touch with scores of parents who were involved in the fight. And this uh, one parent said to me just recently, she said, Miss Virginia, you know, her kids are grown and out of college. College. These kids would have never had an opportunity to go to college. She was the scariest mother I ever met. She scared me to death. She was tough and strong-willed and told me to shut up and I mean and became one of the best activists and advocates I've ever seen. And she told me recently, you and the group that we were involved with and John Boehner were the people that believed in us. Everybody has treated us with disrespect. Yeah. Everybody else told us we were stupid and brainwashed. We fought because of people like Catherine and, and, and there were many others. And, and that's when things changed. Yeah. We weren't scared of the teachers union. Yeah. We weren't scared of the bureaucracy. Yeah. We were scared that our children would fail if we didn't speak right. up. Right. So we didn't know about homeschooling. DC, if you homeschool, you might as well be put in jail. They didn't want you to homeschool. <laughs> and long as parents didn't have a clue yep. what that meant, yep. many of them had gone through DC public school system and were uneducated. I was telling somebody today, and, and, and we go to these cities and we meet these families of these children who are just not getting an education. One of my proudest moments was to tell Ted Kennedy, leave us alone. <laughs> well, Jenny, on that note, I ain't scared. Oh, on the Ted Kennedy okay. note. <laughs> <laughs>